Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss the reports of what Rishi Sunak intends to include in the King's speech for the state opening of Parliament next month. If the reports are accurate, he is doubling down on his most unpopular misadventures this year. It would appear that Rishi Sunak's plan is to annoy as many people as possible, including the King. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So Parliament is prorogued, all perfectly legal this time, in order to prepare for a new session of Parliament. And the idea is the government sets out what its legislative priorities are and the reigning monarch reads them out at the state opening of Parliament. Um, this will not be the first time Charles has done it because he, he has deputised, uh, but it's the first time as king. And not that it is of enormous consequence in itself, especially for Republicans, but the idea that Rishi Sunak is going to make King Charles read out a speech where he says that his government is going to take a massive dump on the environment is certainly interesting. It is very broadly agreed that Charles has been very much ahead of the curve when it comes to climate issues. When Sunak told him not to attend the COP meeting earlier this year, Charles got his own back by inviting people to the palace to discuss climate issues and raise the profile of the event. So even though ordered by Downing Street not to go, Charles made his position really clear anyway. And now he's reportedly going to be reading out a speech where he explains that his government will be expanding North Sea gas and oil drilling and making it harder for pedestrians and cyclists to get about, encouraging more use of cars. Policies he is implacably opposed to. Mind you, the king doesn't get a vote or a say, and even if he did, it's just one vote. What's of more importance is that Sunak is going to be annoying people who really can give his party a bad time at the ballot box. It's quite interesting to see this report in The Guardian as opening up a clear divide with Labour. Now, if this is the purpose of Sunak's intention to raise the profile of these policies via the king's speech, it would be very much in keeping with his childishly incompetent attempt at politics. It's like he's thinking that, well, because Labour are on course to win the next election, we need to show people how the Conservatives are going to be different. And you go, OK, in principle, there is wisdom in that. Because at the next election, Labour are going to attract votes from lots of, for lots of different reasons. You know, there's going to be some voting for Labour because they like their policies. There'll be some voting for Labour or other parties just to defeat the Tories. You know, but there's always some voters who... They're not really bothered about the difference between Labour and the Conservatives. Um, they will just vote for competence over incompetence. And for these voters, that's why if the government's tickling along all right, they'll vote for the party of government because it's like, well, the, the opposition are an unknown quantity and we're sort of happy with the competence of this government. But at the moment, no one can really say that the government's competent. So for these voters, Sonic has very little chance of persuading them that he wins on the competency stakes. So he needs to work on the idea that there is a difference in policy to vote for for these people, that it does make a difference. Unfortunately, Sunak seems to have focused in on uh, one of the very popular Labour policy areas. And one of the features supposedly in this King's speech will be making it harder for local authorities to apply 20 mile an hour limits on roads. But as I keep saying, these are actually locally very popular including, sometimes especially, in Conservative councils. The reason you see so many, it's not just because they save lives and the councillors all want to save lives, it's because locals badger their councillors to have them set up. Imagine the scenario, local activist group lobbying their council for a 20 mile an hour zone. And, and let's be honest, most of these people tend to be retired, right? Big voters only to be told by the council that the Tory government is making it too difficult. I'm not saying that these lobbyists will then instantly decide to vote Labour, but it is nudging them in that direction. And when Labour are already looking nailed on to win, nudging even more voters in their direction seems strategically, well, a little bit dim. And consider how this came about. This isn't because Rishi Sunak's discovered from polling that lots of people want these 20 mile an hour zones scrapped. It's because this so-called, this pro-motorist policy came about because they made it an issue in a by-election for a constituency which had never been won by Labour and the Conservatives won it by a narrow margin and that was this huge win and on the basis of that they completely changed their national policies on motoring. This despite the fact that they then went on to lose two further by-elections in safer seats. Absolute madness. 
And madness that Sunak is now putting his head down and charging this general policy position through. You know, there's a huge part of me thinks, in reality, actually Sonak can't be this stupid and he's doing it because there's a lucrative angle for him. That he's just conning his own MPs, who probably are thick, into thinking that it's a good strategic move. If so, more fool his MPs because it's a stunningly bad move. I talked recently about how his major target voter would be, according to polls, female mortgage-free homeowners, probably in their 60s, these are not the sort of voters who are attracted to these policies of making roads more dangerous. No. So this is Sonak. He can make more money. This is what this is for, for Sonak to make more money. He, he recently, on a slightly related note, responded to a freedom of information request. So he was having meetings with BP and someone said, we'd like to know what you talked about. Um, you know, big oil giant, who also coincidentally, I'm sure, have agreed a huge business deal with his father-in-law's company, Infosys, and will, of course, be benefiting from all these North Sea oil and gas licenses. And Sunak basically said in his response to this freedom of request letter, it's none of our business what he was talking about with the company that is going to be benefiting commercially from his policies. I'm pretty sure it is our business. But it's just another sign that Sunak is dedicating the next year to making himself and his family a lot richer, as well as earning other valuable favours for the future. But as ridiculous as it may seem to make an environmentally conscious king read out a speech saying, we're going to wreck the climate for another year, it would be even more ridiculous to get him to say, my government is going to spend its final session of Parliament draining our national resources dry in pursuit of the mother of all retirement plans for the Prime Minister. Even Tory MPs might smell a rap then. What I don't understand is how they think this is good for them. Sunak and his team keep banging on about these long-term decisions, long-term decisions. But not only are they clearly not taking long-term decisions, how is not rebuilding and repairing the schools that are collapsing, a long-term decision. No, it's not. Porter cabins are not a long-term decision. They're not taking long-term decisions. But you wouldn't at this point in the parliamentary cycle anyway. The way politics works in practice is that at the start of the cycle, you work on the stuff that will take a few years to show the benefits. Get it started early so you can get the benefits by the time the next election rolls around. At the end of the cycle, you're focusing on short-term games. What can we get really quickly? Yes, that doesn't stop you from taking genuinely long-term decisions, but they get you no electoral credit. Voters vote depending on what they see. They'll judge the fruits of your work. Long-term decisions do not yield fruit for an election because by the time you see the benefit, assuming there is a benefit, the ministers who implement it, they're long gone. It's the main reason why so few genuinely long-term decisions are ever made in this country. It's why, you know, talking of high-speed rail, we still don't have it. Other countries have had it for decades. You know, you do get some, but they are always lower priority than the ones that will win you votes at the next election. And that is, unfortunately, the right way to think about it strategically, because even if you genuinely want the best for your country... You can't maintain your long-term decision if you lose the following election. It'd be madness to put in place a long-term decision, then lose the election, because then your opponents will just dismantle it. So this long-term decision bollocks is pointless. The public aren't buying it, and Tory MPs shouldn't either. As for the nonsense about, like, tougher prison sentences for serious offences like rape, I mean, what are they playing at? I mean, yes, OK, I get it. This sort of rhetoric works most of the time. But do they not understand the current context? Like right now for the Tories, it's a really limited impact for three reasons. First, Labour are noisily pointing out that the charge rate for crimes like rape is really low. Doesn't matter what the sentence is if the offenders don't even get charged. Second, the government recently had to stop judges from sentencing people to prison because they'd run out of room. How many people are going to fall for the tougher sentence shtick if you don't have the prisons to implement it? And third, there are two Tory MPs being investigated specifically for rape, to say nothing of those who've already been booted out of Parliament for lesser sexual assaults. You'd think the party would want something to stop talking about sexual assault crimes, wouldn't you? All in all, from what I can tell from these reports, this King's speech, the last one before the election, 
Looks like it's almost designed to cost as many seats for the Tories as possible. You know, it involves talking about green issues, a platform where Labour are much stronger. About crime, a platform where Labour, unusually, is much stronger. Housing, where Labour also leading. In fact, the only two areas where polls even suggest the Tories can compete is defence and the economy. Yet, according to the reports I've seen, Sunak is not going to mention those at all. So to Tory MPs, I say this. Enjoy your biggest wipeout since 1906. It's going to be richly deserved. We may even see the king surreptitiously dancing along to things can only get better. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.